Hi everyone, I'm Shelly and you're watching There's No Place Like Home. It's time for another installment of my Question the Narrative series. And I'm going to go back today to the Chicago World's Fair. Because last time we went over the architecture of the World's Fairs and just the question of how could it possibly have been done with their technology and the fact they only have ho had horses and buggies and, you know, they, they seem to construct a lot of these fairs after really strange times. Like, for example, here's just one view of the Chicago World's Fair, and it was supposedly all built within two years of time, 800 acres of land, and it was built about 20 years after the entire city of Chicago was decimated by a fire. And then if you actually look at the San Francisco World's Fair, too, it's, it's just as odd because the San Francisco World's Fair, I believe, was built about nine years after the San Francisco earthquake, and then there was also a fire. So instead of rebuilding their cities, which uh, apparently they also did, they also had time to build these really extravagant World's Fairs. And so the question really is, why? Why did they do it? Now, the, mainstr the mainstream narrative is that they did it to showcase things, you know, their accomplishments, um, in science and architecture, agriculture, art, just to name a few areas. And really, you know, that's, they could have done that. But again, I, I just really, I'm not sure why they would have gone about doing it in a way that, um, was not only so extravagant, it was so expensive. Most of the world's fairs actually ended up losing money. And again, I just want to say that these, these world's fairs were built after a catastrophes like fires and earthquakes, and yet they still somehow managed to put all of these things together. And, you know, I, I would just, we've been talking about the resets for my last few videos and just the question of where it seems like a lot of people seem to just all of a sudden show up um, and they don't seem like they really fit. And I'm not going to get too much into that today either. I'll link my my other videos in the description box. You can check those out because I know that this video is probably already going to take too much time. But to me, the reset population reminds me of if you've ever seen the movie Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. I don't know if you've seen it or not, but when they go back in time, they bring back like Napoleon and Joan of Arc and all these people from the past. And when they brought them back to the, to the present with them, you know, they, they kind of showed them around. They took them to the mall to show them what it was all about. And Napoleon and Joan of Arc, like, were completely, they had no idea that what anything was, and they were amazed. And that is really what I think of when it comes to these World's Fairs, because it really does seem like it just does not fit the, the population that was there at the time, at least with the narrative that we've been told with the horses and buggies and not really having much much technology at all. And so with the, the World's Fairs losing so much money, and if they really did build these things, all of the resources that they used, the question really is, again, why did they do it? And a lot of people think, and I'm one of them, that there's a good possibility that they could have been used for um, re-education of a population. Maybe some people coming over from a different country, they, they could have come and maybe claimed an area that was possibly already built but abandoned. A lot of people question the term founded because if you actually look into maritime law, you will learn a lot about the English language. But uh, um, founded, some people call that found dead. For example, you you find you they they found the buildings and they were already built, but there was no one there. You know, like when you use the term dead, when it comes to when you go somewhere, you know, you go to a, a party. Oh, it was really dead there. And so that's what a lot of people are questioning is why they use some terms that they use. And that's really for another video altogether. But right here we have this view of the Chicago World's Fair. And again, about 20 years after a, an a fire decimated the entire city. Um, and again, the San Francisco decided to have a World's Fair nine years after their whole city was decimated by not only an earthquake, but also a fire. So why was this so important to them? And so I want to just go back to the original picture that I had here. And, you know, really, this would have been the perfect place for, for them to be teaching people about what, what the, the history is, how things work, um, an introduction to what life is going to be like there. And again, I go back to that whole Bill and Ted's thing. It, it really seems to make me think of that. 
Interestingly, um, some of these World's Fairs were said to have passports. Now, this I actually did a screen grab of a John Levi video because I, I couldn't find this. I was really searching. I was searching um, World's Fair passports and I was trying all different terms and I could not pull this up. So I cannot guarantee that this was actually a World's Fair passport. That is what he, he said in one of his videos and I thought it was interesting. But again, I can't verify that that's what that was. But one thing that I did find was they actually gave out diplomas to people once they went through the World's Fair. So here's one from the Pan American Exposition. This was the one in Buffalo, New York um, in 1901. And you can't see a whole lot, but you can see here that it says commemorative diploma. And again, it really makes you think, why would they be handing out diplomas to people who were going through these World's Fairs? Because diplomas are given to people when they, after they have completed some form of education. So, yeah, it really is a question to ask. Now, let's get into some things that some people might know about. It's not particularly hidden, but it's not well known. But, you know, we already talked about how the World's Fairs were said to be used to showcase the science and architecture, agriculture, art, and so on. But the fact is, is that there was so much more at these World's Fairs that was really questionable. Let's start out with the human zoos. There were human zoos at the World's Fairs. Um, so right here it says people from tribes living at the fair were recruited, it spelled it wrong, to participate in anthropology days and athletic events. Events. Um, and then we can just read down a little bit here. There were more than 50 different Native American tribes, Native people from all over the world, such as the Ainu from Japan and Pygmies from South Africa, the Patagonian giant, giants from Argentina, and various Filipino tribes on the fairgrounds. Yes, so all of those different groups were there at the World's Fair. Now, let's look down here. Um... He explained that contracts from the 1893 fair in Chicago with the concessionaires who were granted human exhibits, human exhibits, yes, you heard that right, mandated that the indigenous people act as savages. So right here, you see a narrative being pushed. They want these people that they have are somehow forcing to be in these human exhibits they want them to act as savages. They are trying to push a narrative. Um, it is believed that they are pushing a narrative of evolution because they, they were trying to push this, this narrative that those with darker skin were somehow less evolved and that as we you know grew into the Europeans, that they were like the pinnacle of, um, of, a, of the evolutionary ladder, so to speak. But yes, they wanted they wanted these these people to act as savages, and yeah, in fact, they made them act as savages. Um, villages were built to replicate those of the. I probably am going to mangle. Actually, I'm not even going to. I you can just see all of these here, and thirty other tribes because I don't want to mangle all those names and thirty other tribes and were stocked stocked. You know, it kind of makes me think of you know. This Sunday or this Saturday is the first day of trout here in Pennsylvania. And, you know, they're stocking the water with the trout and here stocked with tribal men, women and children as living exhibits, according to Positively Filipino, which notes the exhibits helped popularize distorted images of the Philippines and its people. Um, and down here it says several Filipinos died en route while on display or after the fair closed, anthropologists removed the brains of some and shipped them to the Smithsonian. So this was really, it was barbaric. And again, the question to me is, are, were some of these people, well, we already know the Native Americans were, were, were here before, before the, some of these Europeans got here. But my question is, was this all to make the, not only the Native Americans, but all of these groups to make them look so savage that there could not be any sort of question that they may have lived some sort of a more civilized, sophisticated life than than what they were um, displaying at the World's Fair. They were basically trying to rewrite history, which, again, we see that happening all the time. Now, I just want to show you this is some photos of the human zoos. 
So these are all from the World's Fairs. All you have to do is type in Human Zoo World's Fair and you will find so many pictures like this. And, you know, I, I just, I can't help but wonder how did they get these people to do this? Um, how did they transport them all there if they were not already living there? How, how did they transport them all there? And really, the funny thing about it is that if, I don't know if you've heard, well, everyone has heard of Geronimo, the famous Apache warrior. Geronimo was actually on display in one of these human zoos. Yes, he was. Now my kitty cat wants to say hi. So here we have Geronimo and he is wearing Western clothing here. Um, and I, I, just, I don't know. I just find the whole idea of someone like Geronimo on display at a world's fair, it's very troubling. And so you can look at it as two scenarios. He was, he was said to be a prisoner of war and that, so he, that is how he ended up at these world's fairs. But my, my other thought is, could this possibly all be a show and that this was something that was put on to push a narrative? I don't know, but here is something that if I found very interesting, let me see. Okay. I'm not going to read this whole thing, but it's called Geronimo, his own story at the world's fair. And when I, I I'm going to read a little bit, like I mentioned, but it, to me, it seems like it's very put on. Remember, he was a prisoner of war. And when people are, you know, when you watch movies and people are held captive or something, a lot of times their, their captors will make them write these notes to let their loved ones know that they're okay and that they're being treated well. And that's really what this seems like to me, or it could also be something that is just for show, something to add to the narrative. And it's something that I think is, is worth thinking about. So this is what Geronimo said. When I was at first asked to attend the St. Louis World's Fair, I did not wish to go. Later, when I was told that I would receive good attention and protection and that the president of the United States said, said that it would be all right, I consented. I'm surprised that he cared what the, what the president of the United States thought. I was kept by parties in charge of the Indian department. We had obtained permission from the president. I stayed in this place for six months. I sold my photographs for 25 cents, and I was allowed to keep 10 cents of this for myself. I also wrote my name for 10, 15, or 25 cents, as the case might be, and kept all of that money. I often made as much as $2 a day, and when I returned, I had plenty of money, more than I had ever owned before. Many people in St. Louis invited me to come to their homes, but my keeper always, it just makes me think of a zookeeper, but my keeper always refused. Every Sunday, the president of the fair sent for me to go to a Wild West show. I took part in the roping contests before the audience. There were many other Indian tribes there and strange people of whom I had never heard. When people first came to the World's Fair, they did nothing but parade up and down the streets. When they got tired of this, they would visit the shows. There were many strange things in these shows. The government sent guards with me when I went, and I was not allowed to go anywhere without them. So I'm going to leave a link to all of these in the description box if you wanted to just keep reading his account of what happened. But this this whole idea of these humans on display, it, it just really... um. To me, it's, just, it's propaganda. They, they are trying to instill in these people who are visiting this a certain history that maybe they possibly don't, don't already know about, something that is new to them, something that is being presented, you know, saying to them, this is how things work. So it, and oh, and it's something else that I found that's really interesting is that, let me try to find that up here. George Washington Carver you see right here, it says it's about George Washington Carver. One of his paintings won honorable mention in the 1893 Chicago World's Fair. So I don't know. To me, it almost seems like, and I'm not saying that he 100% that that didn't happen. But what I am saying is that sometimes you, you just become so untrustworthy of the things that were being told that I can't help thinking, are they placing all of these people at these World's Fairs for the future narrative? Um, to kind of instill this story of of certain famous people. 
And you will actually see that in another story that I have here. Uh, let's see. So a lot of the um, stories, I don't want to keep saying narratives because I, I'm repeating myself, but a lot of the things that we see, what we would consider to be from the Rockefellers, we, we actually see a lot of these things being presented at these World's Fairs, and I happen to come across this. And again, this is talking about the Chicago World's Fair, but it said, when the World's Fair opened in 1893, equal rights for, for women was still a futuristic dream. American women couldn't vote and were relegated to the margins of public life. But the times, they were slowly changing. Prominent women spoke at the fair about a number of issues, including women's right icon Susan B. Anthony, labor rights reformer Florence Kelly, and abolitionist Julia Ward Howe. Now, this is the part that really I found interesting. When the Chicago World's Fair was funded through Congress, money was specifically allocated to make sure that the women that women were represented. So the Chicago World's Fair was funded through Congress. And you know me. I'm a homeschool mom who is very suspicious of the school system. Why? Because it is a government education system. So when I see that the Chicago World's Fair was funded through Congress, again, all that that enters my mind is, is this all propaganda? Is that what we are looking at when we are looking at these World's Fairs and that it really wasn't about showcasing the, the talents just to people who were already there, but was it about introducing people to an entirely new storyline? Something to think about. And the last thing that I want to talk to you about in this video today is where, where did our history come from? Who wrote it down? Well, the fact is that a man named Hubert Howe Bancroft, um, it says here he was an American historian and ethnologist. He was actually responsible for writing a huge portion of American history. And interestingly, he also penned a book about the Chicago World's Fair, Book of the Fair. So the same person who wrote the book about the fair is the same person who wrote most of American history. So let's just read a little bit down here about him. Um, in March 1852, Bancroft was provided with an inventory of books to sell and was sent to the booming California city of San Francisco to set up a West Coast regional office of the firm. He was successful in building his company, entering the world of publishing in the process. He also became a serious collector of books, building a collection, numbering into the tens of thousands of volumes. So while he was in California, he wasn't just selling books. He was collecting books and he accumulated tens of thousands of volumes of what he says were firsthand accounts of people in the United States. And again, this is this is all something that he will eventually write about. So in 1868, he resigned from his business in favor of his brother, A.L. Bancroft. He had accumulated a great library of historical material and abandoned business to devote himself entirely to writing and publishing history. Bancroft's library consisted of books, maps, and printed and manuscript documents, including a large number of narratives dictated to Bancroft or his assistants by pioneers, settlers, and statesmen. The indexing of the vast collection employed six persons for 10 years. The library was moved in 1881 to a fireproof building and in 1900 numbered about 45,000 volumes. He developed a plan to publish a history in 39 volumes of the entire Pacific Coast region of North America, from Central America to Alaska. He employed writers and wrote some of the material himself, though he credited only himself as an author. That was nice of him. In 1886, the publishing establishment of A.L. Bancroft and Company burned. Of course it did. Of course. Just like the World's Fairs mostly ended up burning as well. Anyway, you, you just can't make this stuff up. Although, you know, they probably did. Anyway, and the sheets of seven volumes of the history he had written were destroyed. Of course they were. 
So I just wanted to finish up this video just reading to you a little bit from a book called Exposing the Expositions, Ancient Rome in America. And I have to say, I don't agree 100% with everything that is written in this book, but I do find it very valuable. I think that there's a lot of good information in it. And this is actually the book where I found out about Hubert Hugh Bancroft. So here's what it says. I'm not going to read everything about it. I could do an entirely separate video just on this man alone, all the stuff on him. But anyway. So what is the true history of this city then? They're talking about Chicago. In fact, a question to ask is, what is history itself? Who was writing the history of the United States? United States. Of course, it becomes no surprise to find that the main person who wrote the entire history of the USA was also the same man who wrote the book of the history of the Columbian Exhibition. The Columbian Exhibition is the Chicago World's Fair. We have to look very closely at the man who wrote the book of the fair, both figuratively and literally, because he is just as important as the book. And from the standpoint of the history of the U.S., he might be the history of the USA. I did not give you the complete title of his Chicago exposition book, which is the book of the fair designed to set forth the display made by the Congress of Nations of human achievement in material form. So as the more effectually to illustrate the progress of mankind in all departments of civilized life. Wow. And I try to keep my titles at like less than nine words. Anyway, um, and he just tells us a little bit more of what we already read. And it says he became a serious collector of books, maps, and manuscript documents, building a collection numbering into the tens of thousands. And it sounds like he just basically quoted what was in here. And then it says a collection of 60,000 books was later purchased by Berkeley University and placed in its named Bancroft Library. Um, I believe that he used the found ancient books, manuscripts, and maps that he had come into his possession to know much of the complete early history of the Americas. But if he wanted to present that real history, he only would have had to update and republish what he had discovered. He could have just reprinted the found books. But my guess is that he did not present the real history, but did the same thing the Egyptologists of Egypt do. Anything important that is found is locked away in the Cairo Museum and never mentioned or seen again. My guess here is that Bancroft did the same thing. By turning over key documents to the Smithsonian, that's, you know, the good old Smithsonian, for safekeeping, which means, sorry, I just lost my place, which means to be put into a safe so no one can ever see them. He then sent to work with a group of 600 collaborators to create the new history of North and South America. So again, I can, I can continue on reading about him because there's several pages, but he ended up writing 39 volumes that were each about 1,500 pages long. So that is 60,000 pages of history that have been written by this one man. And again, let's remember that he didn't just update the books that he had found. He actually rewrote everything. And one last tidbit is that it is believed that he was also a Freemason. So that is interesting, too. I thought this was the last thing that I was going to talk to you about, but actually I forgot to mention that I was saying to you about how we were, how it was all about getting a new narrative going. And let's not forget that the world's fairs, besides having these human zoos and teaching about science and all of that, they also talked about places around the world. So they had exhibitions about Egypt. I'm trying to find it here. It's just the Ferris wheel. Um, well, anyway, they had they had exhibitions about Egypt. They had exhibitions about all of these different countries around the world giving, you know, the story of their history. And again, it's almost like they basically jam packed all of, you know, the, the country and the world history into this little fair to kind of introduce this to people who may not have been privy to this information ever before. Um, and also, I just... I keep remembering more stuff I wanted to show you. This is a photo from the Chicago World's Fair. Again, 1893, people rode horse and buggies at this time. This was 20 years after a fire decimated the entire city. Look at all these people. I mean, where did they come from? And to me, if you're going to repopulate... <laughs> That surely would look very similar to what it is. And if you look like down here, even it's packed. It is completely packed. 
Where did these people come from? That's all that I have for you today. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up. If you haven't subscribed yet and would like to hear more of what I have to say, I would love if you would do that. If you have any questions or comments, you can leave one here or you can leave one on Instagram or on my YouTube community page. And if you like my work and would like to check out my Patreon page, I will leave a link in the description box for that as well. And I hope you have a great day.